Hey everybody, this is Dr. Adam Rindy and welcome to the One Thing Podcast. Today's episode is on endometriosis with Dr. Laura Bryden, a worldwide expert in women's health disorders. We're speaking with her today about the perspective of endometriosis as a chronic inflammatory disorder rather than purely a hormonal disorder. Endometriosis is one of the most troubling women's health conditions that affects women on a level that can cause work disruption, relationship disruption, problems with academics, pain that is month long, not just during the cycles or leading up to the cycles. This is a serious pain problem that often goes overlooked and does not get diagnosed for years. In today's episode, we'll learn some really good viewpoints of how to treat endometriosis from a chronic inflammation perspective. And Dr. Bryden has a whole tool chest of resources and treatments and suggestions for people who are struggling with this. She is the author of the Period Repair Manual. A lot of her concepts can be reviewed in that book. I encourage everybody after this episode to look that up on Amazon. We'll put the link in our show notes and Without further ado, I'm going to welcome this very special guest all the way from New Zealand, Dr. Lara Bryden. I'm here today with Dr. Lara Bryden, and she's uh, joining us all the way from New Zealand. And we're going to talk today about endometriosis. And uh, welcome to the One Thing Podcast. Hi, Adam. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to speak. And I know you've been very busy lately, so I appreciate you carving some time out for us. Um, So we were going to jump right into hearing a little bit about your background as far as how you um, became interested in endometriosis. And why don't we start with that? Yeah, of course. So I've been a naturopathic doctor since 97. So I guess that's a little more than two decades. And of course, treating lots of women because women come to see us as naturopathic doctors because they're often, well, very often just not getting the solutions they need you know, from in other places. So yeah, over the years I've, I've seen a, treated a lot of endometriosis and I've just, yeah, come to have, I think maybe some sort of interesting insights into the disease. It's, it's not what we think it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, um, it responds yeah, to a different set of treatments than, you know, what I expected heading out so what, as a young naturopath and treating it. That's yeah. very interesting. So what do we think it is? And, and in your yeah. view, um, what model do you look at? What lens do you look through for yeah. endometriosis? So we tend to lump it into the group of period problems, maybe loosely thinking it's a hormonal issue, maybe it's some, you know, like other period problems, PCOS is a hormonal issue, for example. But really at its heart, endometriosis is a disease of inflammation and immune dysfunction that's more in the category of, say, inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis or in that group Mm -hmm. of diseases. So that is, that's the way I've been treating it for a while now, probably, you know, a decade and a half or more. And just going straight, looking at it through that lens, going straight for those sorts of treatments and getting better results than I did when trying to treat it as a hormonal condition. Okay. So previously it was more along the the conventional recommendations would be something more along oral contraceptives going that route to maybe stabilize hormones. And in your approach looks at stabilizing or balancing inflammation in the body. Actively reducing inflammation, actively working on the microbiome and immune modulating treatments in particularly using lately. I've been in the last maybe seven or eight years recruiting using more antimicrobial herbal medications, which we have, you know, as naturopathic doctors, we have access to, yeah, some interesting treatments, antimicrobials like berberine and um, oregano oil and things like that, that seem to make quite a big difference with this disease. Okay. So let's, let's kind of go into that a little deeper. So when I think about inflammatory problems, chronic inflammatory problems, I sort of look at first the conversation is around like TH1 and TH2 balance. Can we start with that and how that relates to endometriosis? We, yeah, we can. The big one that, so we, there is, there are abnormal, abnormalities with the T cells. 
in this disease. And actually where the main abnormality seems to lie is with something called the T regulator cells or the T reg. And they're in charge. They're like the, the generals or the directors of the immune system, um, you know, regulating the adaptive immune system and telling it when to attack and when to pull back. And there does seem to be something going on with that, particularly with the T reg cells in the pelvic cavity itself. So they, they're not behaving normally in women with endometriosis. There's a couple of studies that point to that. And so that can occur for different reasons. I think, I think with any time the T cells are behaving abnormally, you also want to go upstream from that and, and think about what are the, you know, potentially what are the stresses that are affecting that? What is the immune system exposed to potentially that would, you know, would be creating these abnormalities? So that brings us to one of the roots of the maybe an inflammatory trigger that might be causing problems from the upstream view. Would that be the yeah. the gut? Yeah. So there's some evidence that intestinal permeability, specifically exposure to the endotoxins of gram-negative bacteria, presumably coming from the gut and translocating into the pelvis, is a factor in endometriosis. It, it's always, with a disease like this, with any kind of immune disease, there's going to be a number of things that have to be in place, a number of factors, including, quite clearly with this disease, including genetics. So some women have a, a vulnerability, or I would say possibly in a few, with a few genes, but almost certainly with the immune system where they are prone to developing this kind of active inflammation. Some women, some women will just never get the disease, and really no matter what happens, no matter what their hormonal balance, what their, you know, the issues with their microbiome or exposures. So there's immune, there's definitely, I think, from the research, it's clear, probably epigenetic changes from exposure to toxins that affect epigenetic changes in probably both immune and hormonal system. And then we have this factor of measurably higher levels of gram-negative bacteria. Mm -hmm in the pelvic cavity and the menstrual fluid of women with endometriosis compared to women who don't have it. Mm -hmm. And the, the assumption is that's probably translocation from the gut because that's where we tend to have higher levels of gram-negative bacteria, especially with um, inflammatory bowel disease or SIBO. There's right. quite a strong link between endometriosis and SIBO. So mm -hmm. that gives us a clue right there. Yeah, I took a course that you offered um, couple years ago, I believe. And you talked about the gram-negative bacteria with its um, signaling of LPS. Yeah. Um, can you sort of patch that together as far as the link between how that fits in with causing the inflammation somewhere that's potentially outside of the gut? Yeah. So the lipopolysaccharide toxin or the LPS, that's from the, the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, is very upsetting to the, to the immune system. We know that in lots of conditions, actually, not just endometriosis, but we know that that will create T cell dysfunction. It, sort of, it activates the immune system. It creates a lot of um, cytokine, inflammatory cytokine production. So to, to measure, you know, potentially measuring LPS is, is a way we can start to see that aspect of the disease. And of course, then there are lots of treatments we can use to try to actively reduced LPS as well, which is what I spoke about in that webinar, just all the different ways we can come at that. Right. So if I recall, it was, you know, treating dysbiosis or maybe a branch of dysbiosis called SIBO, like you just mentioned, yep. healing the gut permeability issues. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'll just say conventional, there's a, in, uh, um, conventional medicine is starting to look at this too. So there was recently a study where they made this rather startling discovery that, that a course of antibiotics in an, in an animal study that a course of antibiotics reduced the size and of the, of endometriosis lesions actually actively reduced the disease, which is very intriguing. Hmm. Not to say that every one of our patients has to go straight to antibiotics. That's not where medicine is at with it just yet, but it does start to give us some insights that we can perhaps come at it that way. Right. Well, I'd say I'd say if most people brought up the, these approaches with their 
their gynecologist or whoever's treating their endometriosis, they'd probably get a blank stare. Is that fair to say? Like, <laughs> yeah, they, they would. And on the topic of conventional treatment, because you mentioned the pill early on for this disease. And here's just a little piece of information about you know, evidence-based versus not evidence-based. I was just reviewing again last night the Cochrane Collaboration Review of, so that's the, you know, the, the ultimate in, um, evidence-based test for treatments. And it was the Cochrane Review of the oral contraceptive pill for endometriosis. And they conclude, and this is pretty recently, there's no evidence that it works, which is quite interesting because of course the pill is routinely prescribed as this attempt to, well, it, it, the pill suppresses the hormonal system. So this is the theory that therefore that will you know, suppress the disease because the disease, endometriosis is worsened. There's no question, it's, it's flares and it can be worsened with the ups and downs, the normal ups and downs of women's hormones. So I guess the thinking is therefore suppressing all those hormones is going to somehow fix it, but it doesn't, it really doesn't, you know, it doesn't always work for women. I've seen that with patients. And so it makes sense to me that the science is not seeing a clear you know, effectiveness rate of giving the pill. Okay. So you, when a patient comes in with complaining of pelvic pain, what, yeah. cl what clues you off as a clinician? Let's say you're, you're sort of seeing a patient in a primary care mindset. What clues you off that endometriosis might be a problem versus another cause of pelvic pain? Yeah, there's a few clues. I have a blog post called When Period Pain is Not Normal. I think first and foremost, it is the severity. So, and this is something as a society, we need to give the message to young women that severe and debilitating pain is never normal. <laughs> you know, and a lot of women don't know that. They've sort of been told, oh, you know, that's, that's just what it is to be a woman. You get this, these painful periods and so they think, okay, I guess that's normal to be curled up on the bathroom floor and crying and having to call, you know, the ambulance and go, to, I mean, I can laugh because that's, that's what's happening again and again. Yeah. And so the message is to your listeners, to everyone, that is never normal. And so with my definition, I would, I would define it in terms of number of painkillers. Like if you're taking a couple of you know, maybe sort of one or you know, one or two Advil or something in a day. That's that's different. That's that's in the category of okay. That's just a little bit of prostaglandin type period pain that that usually will respond completely to natural treatments quite quickly. But and on the other hand, endometriosis pain or pain that's stemming from some kind of underlying disease process, you're more in the territory of you know, six Advil a day and six Tylenol a day. And it's, wow. not, even, it's not even touching it. And yeah. they can't go to work or they can't go to school. That, that kind of situation. So in one of the things I suggest is, you know, with my readers and patients, just try the, the, the standard basic treatments for normal period, what I call normal period pain, knowing that actually period pain is, it's not never normal to have period pain. I think most women can expect to have no pain Mm -hmm. periods. But let's say your standard period pain, I'll say, you know, do the, the dairy-free diet, some zinc, maybe some vitamin B1, magnesium. That should pretty much within the first cycle or two eliminate pain. And if it doesn't, if the pain persists, then straight away, that's an indication that something else is going on. Well, that was very helpful because, you know, as a, especially as a male clinician, you know, it's like we we have our own perception of pain, um, but we have no idea how how an individual's pain tolerance is. And I guess that to kind of normalize some pain is helpful. And then to hear those metrics that you use is is really helpful. And I think you know that's really important for people to to just bring up those objective measures with their providers so that they're steered in the right direction. Yeah, four to six Advils in a day is, you know, would raise some yeah. eyebrows. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what I say to my patients, especially when I'm sending them back to see their gynecologist to get further assessment is say to the doctor how many painkillers you're using and the fact that that still means you have to miss work. And I guess the other test, it's worth mentioning, the other tests for endometriosis is pain 
between periods, pain after the period, pain with sex, pain with you know, bowel movements, other sorts of pelvic issues going on. Sometimes bladder symptoms can be a sign of underlying endometriosis. So it's, a, it's actually a full body inflammatory disease that can be associated with a number of different pelvic symptoms in particular. And it takes a while to get a proper diagnosis, right? I would imagine people could live with this for years before someone finally says, this is what you're dealing with. Yeah, I think the average is 10 years. 10 years. Wow. And it does usually start quite young. So there was this sort of idea with, among some doctors that, oh, endometriosis doesn't affect young women, but it 100% does. So it often starts up during the teen years. Okay. And is there any blood tests that, um, for early detection? Not at this stage, but everyone is hoping. So there's the possibility of either a blood test or a saliva test or a menstrual fluid test. It's the kind of, it's exactly the kind of inflammatory disease that should have biomarkers. But nothing's come to market yet. And every six months or so, we see a news item that they're working on it. I think at the moment, there is a company in the UK that is promising something coming to market within the next 12 months. So that would be really good news. Okay. Well, I love pathophysiology. So I want to get back to one thing that you mentioned, um, the Treg. So what what do we want the Treg to be doing and what is it not doing in endometriosis? Yes. So again, the T regulator cells, they're a type of T cell that my understanding, and obviously immunology is a complex field. So I have a fairly rudimentary understanding of it myself, but my, the, the Treg cells are the generals of the adaptive immune system. So they are, you know, yeah, telling, telling the immune cells when to, when to develop, when to produce antibodies, when to attack, and when to pull back. So that's the, on the one hand, that's the adaptive immune system has, seems to have this dysfunction of the Treg cells. But on the innate, the side of the innate immune system, with endometriosis, there's some other things going on too, which is that in particular, the, the macrophages are not, they're not gobbling up. You know how they do phagocytosis? They're supposed to eat up problematic tissue, right. infectious tissue and inflamed tissue. They're not doing that the way they're supposed to be doing. So this is like it's resolvins, that type of problem yeah, where, where the macro, macrophages yeah. are coming in and clearing the inflammation. It's kind of getting stuck. Yeah, and also they're supposed to be gobbling up some of the, the inflamed lesions themselves. Mm-hmm. It was just a study just this week, actually, so I can, we can put it in the notes. So this is how, how quickly the research is evolving into immune dysfunction and endometriosis. I'll, I'll send you the link later of yeah, just demonstrating that macrophages are falling down on their job of clearing inflamed tissue. So that's, that gives an idea of the complexity of it. And just back to the T reg cells, that's something, you know, regulating immune function or modulating immune function is something that naturopathic medicine does quite well. I think that's always been one of our strengths is we have treatments and ideas for ways to modulate and try to normalize immune function, that, like a variety of treatments that conventional medicine doesn't yet have. So... For example, you know, one way to regulate T reg cells is glutathione. Mm. It's a wonderful. <laughs> we think of it as an antioxidant, the body's innate antioxidant, but it's actually quite a strong immune regulator mm-hmm. as well. So supporting glutathione with things like N acetylcysteine and selenium, even sometimes giving glutathione mm-hmm. seems quite helpful for this disease. It's mm. one of the, some of the treatments that I would use. Okay. And, you know, it seems like to, with an, with an, an immune system that's sort of overpowered, um, it seems like there's a lot of different naturopathic angles you would take with this condition. Can you just kind of expand, you know, some of the different categories like detoxification or um, we already talked about gut health. What about any hormone balancing? Do you take any approach with hormone balancing in that condition? Well, let's go through it. Let's go through it kind of from the beginning. I think just to go back to the gut health for a minute, because it's so central. I do think step one for any of my endometriosis patients, this is how I speak about it to them. We need to resolve that gut issue. 
So we need you to, uh, basically I'll say to them, as long as you have SIBO, you're going to have this disease. So we need to focus on that. And usually often focusing on that is what gives the fastest relief in terms of symptoms as well. So that's, that's good. Treating the potentially one of the underlying drivers at the same time as giving relief. So of course, treating SIBO can involve, well, it does involve diet changes. So I remove, I think step one is to remove foods that are potentially actively inflammatory for the gut. That includes gluten. In most cases of endometriosis, they really do need to strictly avoid gluten. Not, mm -hmm. you know, the phrase is, um, there's no such thing as partially gluten-free for an inflammatory condition like this. Yeah. And then I would say strictly avoid cow's dairy, except I do permit butter and goat cheese because what I'm trying to, re what I've got my eye on is A1 casein, a particular kind of inflammatory oh, yeah. casein yeah. that seems to be quite problematic for the immune system that activates mast cells and, you know, creates an inflammatory situation in the gut and potentially moving into the pelvis. So those are important. You know, many clinicians will look at removing FODMAPs and kind of fermentable, fermentable foods, at least short term for helping SIBO. I, think it, I don't think you want to be doing that long term because we need many of those fermentable foods for their, you know, um, prebiotic beneficial effects lower down in the gut. But I also look at things to promote gut motility. I, I do prescribe um, HCL or hydrochloric acid sometimes to help things to move along. And I, as I said, I do a course of a herbal antimicrobial pretty early on in the treatment. Sometimes that needs repeating mm -hmm. because as you know, with SIBO, it can relapse. There's some evidence that actually SIBO, I'm sure you know, has a, itself has kind of an autoimmune inflammatory component because of the, it's called, I forgot the full name, the, the motility kind of complex. Migrating motor oh. complex. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Say it again. Say it again. The, uh, MMC, which is yes. um, my migrating, migrating motor complex. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So that my understanding is, was in some cases of SIBO, that that can be under, you know, have um, sort of a, an active inflammatory effect that stim that um, that is inhibiting the function of that complex. So yeah, you, yeah by removing reducing inflammation, you're potentially reactivating that complex. I've also started giving. Um, well, I use, I use magnesium to help with gut motility as well. Zinc, vitamin A is really important for healing the gut lining and immune mm -hmm. function generally. I've had my eye on vitamin A a bit more recently. It's interesting because way back 25 years ago, as a young naturopath, we used to give vitamin A quite routinely for immune issues. I've mm -hmm. kind of sort of moved away from it and look, coming back to it again is actually quite important for gut. Yeah, we used to give, um, we used to see a fair share of, um, HIV patients back when there wasn't as good management as there is now. Um, and yeah. vitamin A was one of the staples of helping with HIV. Yep. Potentially, um, you know, colostrum or lactoferrin, which of course is dairy, but it is, it's the whey portion of dairy. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the not inflammatory portion of dairy. So that can be helpful. And then certain looking at different probiotics, we need to be careful because I mean some probiotics I think can worsen histamine or you know not not ideal for SIBO. So there's a lot of work to be done there, and that can I'll just say again that can give immediate relief, right? To the disease itself. Yeah, it's not, it's not complete relief, but it certainly start to help. It's interesting. I really like this approach because you know if you think about like inflammation as a faucet, you know if if you were to say well this is an inflammatory disorder, let's just crush the inflammation and turn off the faucet, then obviously there's other problems that can come about, but this is more about sort of turning down the faucet. So it's just a, sort of a, there's probably still some triggers there, but you're, you're balancing it so that the manifestation or the outcome of that inflammation is less lesions, less pain. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, dialing back the drivers of the inflammation. The thing about endometriosis, the, the lesions themselves that can be quite substantial, I mean, you can have quite a lot within the pelvis, they generate their own inflammation and their own hormones actually. So mm. that's why arguably, you know, with some patients, I, I am in the camp where I think that in some cases the excision surgery 
can be important to remove, actually remove the lesions. So at, and at the same time, remove or reduce the, the gut inflammation that's driving the formation of more lesions or the worsening of lesions. So mm-hmm. that, that can happen sort of at the same time. And then at the same time, come in with things to, as we spoke about before, you know, support the T regulator cells, suppress inflammatory or re- reduce inflammatory cytokines. So that's when you start looking at things like N-acetylcysteine, selenium, turmeric, of course, is wonderful for this kind of disease process, curcumin, potentially glutathione. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that starts to give a, a broader picture of what I, I might be looking at, vitamin D you know, to help with immune function. And then and only then, you know, I do start to look at the hormonal side of things. So we can, we can speak about that. I think what from the hormonal perspective, there's two main considerations. One is that, yes, estrogen, high levels of estrogen are like, they're like gasoline on the fire of this disease, right? They don't, estrogen doesn't cause the disease, but when the disease is present, it definitely worsens it quite substantially Mm -hmm. because it stimulates the lesions directly. It also affects immune function. So both progesterone and estrogen affect immune function in the way that, as we, I'm sure many of you listeners know, estrogen is a driver potentially of of inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, whereas progesterone is an inhibitor of those. So we can even, even think looking at this whole disease through the immune lens, we can see sort of a new perspective of how a new way that the, the hormones could be influencing things. So we have the, the problem of excess estrogen, and then we have, which we'll talk about how you reduce that. And then we have the problem potentially of progesterone resistance. So my experience with endometriosis patients is they, they are making progesterone. Usually they're having ovulatory cycles usually, but not responding to their progesterone as well as they should. So there's potentially a few ways we can get around that. But the high, the high estrogen, as you know, a big, a big part of that is clearance through, through the gut. So that comes back to a second role of the gut is that healthy metabolism of clearance from, from the gut and preventing and uh, dealing with what's um, called beta-glucuronidase, which is the, as you probably know, is the bacterial product or enzyme that deconjugates and recycles estrogen. That's a big, that's a big issue with the gut. Actually, what I'd like to see with gut testing, I don't do a lot of gut testing yet because I'm just not sort of happy with any of the the options that are available to me Mm -hmm. as a clinician, but the gut testing marker that I think is quite helpful is actually measuring beta-glucuronidase, which I think you can do with some panels, measuring the the quantity of that bacterial enzyme. Yeah, that's, uh, I've seen it on um, Genova's tests and also the yeah. GI, GI map has it now. Yeah. So you can downregulate that with the supplement calcium deglucurate, which is also yeah, quite helpful for this condition and, and other, other conditions that are more hormonal conditions. And also just fixing the gut, you know, um, reducing the, the production of, of that enzyme by re- addressing dysbiosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, so can you pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about the progesterone resistance? Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting one. Unfortunately, I think there's some research to suggest that that progesterone resistance is inherited as an epigenetic change from toxin exposure, potentially from dioxin exposure hmm. through multiple generations, which is very interesting. I provided a study or a couple studies in that webinar that you referred to. We can put that in the show notes if we want. So that's a little bit, on the one hand, that's kind of depressing because, you know, that means that with this individual woman sitting in front of us, you know, the, she's, she's been set up to have this problem of just a resistance that is potentially going to be a little bit harder to overcome. But at the same time, it also, what I say to my endometriosis patients is this is not something she's done wrong, right? You know, I think so much, the flip side of, of functional medicine, I mean, the good thing about functional medicine is there's these things we can do with diet and lifestyle and supplements to improve things. But then there, there can be this idea that, oh, maybe 
from in patients' minds, certainly not what we're saying to them, but in patients' minds, it's, oh, well, maybe, you know, I have this because of something I've done wrong, something I've eaten wrong, something I've, you know, some supplement I should have been taking. taking. So I do say to people, this is, you know, you didn't cause this disease. Yeah. <laughs> this was potentially set up, you know, generations ago. So, which is, which is helpful. I think that's important. So, Definitely. but back to, yeah, how do we address it? Yeah. Well, let me, let me just ask you a question about progesterone resistance. So how, yeah. would you, how would you know that's going, taking place? Is there a way that like a hormone panel would look or is it certain symptoms that someone would have? Yeah, oh. at, this stage, at this stage, I don't think there's a way to assess that clinically. In the research, they assess it. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm not sure what, what they're doing exactly in the labs, but they're able to measure... Um, you know, changes with the progesterone receptor. So just back to the progesterone receptor, there are, there is a SNP, like a, a, a polymorphism of the progesterone receptor that I have, that we can measure as clinicians that I've been testing with some patients, but I don't, that's different. Having the polymorphism would be different than having the epigenetic changes that the research is describing. So I don't, yeah, I don't know of a clinical way to measure that. I, I guess my, I'm at the point where I think almost by definition with this disease that that is probably present mm -hmm. um, some degree of epigenetic resistance. Yeah. So, so yeah. I know you, I know you need to wrap up here for another meeting. So did, is there anything yeah. you could tell us about some actionable, actionable steps that yeah. we can do for progesterone resistance? Well, I do recommend potentially giving natural progesterone mm, okay. to the idea to, you know, overcome that resistance to some extent just by having higher levels of progesterone. Certainly giving progestins, the contraceptive drugs progestins, is part of the mainstream treatment or you know, helping to prevent this disease. So they give, you know, the, the hormonal IUD, which is levingestrol, that's the progestin, the San is the brand name, I'm forgetting the, the name of that progestin drug. But in my experience, giving progesterone usually orally or sometimes vaginally that's the micronized progesterone body identical progesterone can be quite helpful and it's better than progestins i find in that it doesn't have the mood side effects of progestin drugs progesterone itself it's quite sedating that's why you give it at bedtime mm -hmm. but it doesn't potentially it's not linked with anxiety and depression the way progestin drugs are Right. And there is a really great section in, in your book, which I'll ask you just to kind of share a little bit about that here when we close, um, that talks about um, the progestins. And I really learned a lot by reading that, that section. Um, sure. So, yeah, well, if you could just give us some, a few take-home points and then um, tell us a little bit about how people can um, find you and, and some, anything you're up to these days, which you, you'd like us to know about. And, yeah. And, yeah, sounds good. So my takeaway for this, for endometriosis is, number one, debilitating pain is never normal. <laughs> so everyone listening can help their, their clients and patients to, you know, to seek the help they need. Number two, I, I just want a chance to mention this, pain, this kind of pain is not a symptom of the hormonal condition PCOS. I mention it, it's a whole other topic, obviously a whole other podcast probably, but I just mention it because so often you know, young women are given a, an ultrasound test to try to sort out what's going on. And then the doctor sees polycystic ovaries and thinks, oh, that must be the explanation. That, that's, polycystic ovaries are never the explanation for pain. So it's important to look beyond that and, you know, just try to assess for endometriosis clinically or with palpation or hopefully one day a, a, a non-invasive test. And then I guess the other takeaway is to really shift perspectives, kind of lateral thinking here. Look at this disease through the lens of a disease of active inflammation and immune dysfunction with only sort of a secondary hormonal component. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that, and focus on SIBO if it's present because it's, it's really central to the condition. Yeah, so those are my takeaways. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really a, a, a view that feels um, you know, solid and actionable too. And, yeah. Um, and also a commonality to 
a lot of immune or inflammatory issues. So um, we have a lot of experience treating people with these tools. Yeah. It's exactly the kind of thing that natural medicine can help with. So that's, you know, what's so great about it. And just to give a sense of expectation, I mean, this disease does not just go away overnight. It's mm-hmm. not that kind of condition. So what I might say to my patients, endometriosis patients is, okay, let's put these things in place. I'm expecting 50% reduction in pain by the three month mark, something like that. With When you're dealing with this amount of pain, that's actually quite a lot, 50%. You know, you'd like to obviously get to 100% one day, mm-hmm. but even to get patients to 50% better can mean, can change their lives. Mm-hmm. And always, you know, having, being conscious that surgery is might be appropriate. You know, I don't think it's, and they definitely don't want patients having surgery after surgery. So that, you know, the surgery side of things needs to be thought about carefully. Patients need to seek more information on having the surgery done properly with excision surgery and coming in with the natural treatments, you know, before and after that to maximize the benefits. That's great. Well, this was so good. Thank you so much for for doing this show with us and sharing so much valuable information um, is uh, I, like I mentioned, I want to hear just briefly like where we can get in touch with you yeah. um, and, and anything that you're up to that you'd like uh, both um, people who are in the lay public and also just the providers to know about um, your professional direction. Sure. Yeah. So everyone can find me. My blog, the period revolutionary is at com. All my social media is at Lara Bryden. I'm, Twitter is my favorite for conversations. I'm also quite active on Instagram, just, you know, replying to comments and sharing a lot of what I hope is, you know, teaching material for the public about hormones and all, you know, all sorts of period problems. I'm doing quite a number of you know, um, lecturing this year, mostly down under, but I, I will hopefully get up to North America in the next um, 12 months or so to teach clinicians as well. And yeah, my book is Period Repair Manual. That's the main resource. So that's available everywhere. Amazon, all the usual places. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you down the road. Thanks, Adam. All right. Take care. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today's episode. Um, It was great speaking with Dr. Bryden. Please share this episode widely with your friends and colleagues trying to get the word out um we have a instagram page called one thing podcast you can also follow me on instagram at dr.adam.rindy and we're doing a lot of communication through social media um, and please keep in touch with us and subscribe in your podcast player so you get the instant notification when the new episodes come out we're on apple we're on stitcher Spotify, pretty much most of the major players. Again, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.